Good. So all of our conversation can be reviewed. Mm. I'll keep it clean if I can. <laughs> so how do we want to start? Andy, you and Scott know each other a little bit. Um, no. and yeah, let me jump in. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Scott for uh, agreeing to talk with us about this. No, Scott and I really haven't met yet. We've talked on the phone. Um, who was the person that gave uh, uh, Kurt Newfeld was the one that I guess talked to you, Scott, and he from and he mentioned um, your experience that you had experiences with a form based code and. One thing led to another, and you and I talked, and and I know that we're stuck here in a, in a, in a certain way on um, form-based code. So I guess, uh, you know, if you want to kick it off, Susan, I can just say, Scott, can you share experiences with us that you've had with form-based code? And if you were a community that was looking at that option, what would you give us for advice? So... Just as introduction, I'm Scott Hastings. I'm the town planner in Standish. And Standish does have a form-based code covering two of the three sort of village centers that we have here. So the Standish Corner and the Sebago Lake Village are both in a form-based code district. Our form-based code district is a particularly uh, Byzantine one. It is a, a lot of moving parts. It's very complicated and works down to pretty fine grained um, look at the different properties that are within the zone. So the, each zone is further broken down on street frontage types and then is attempting to look at the building massing and the types of uses and the lo location of development for each different street frontage type. And that's a uh, very, that can be a very complicated thing. There's a lot of different moving parts. That is not necessarily how other form-based codes work. So I think it's, it's gonna be a little tricky to give you a broad overview. Uh, certainly my, my quick answer is that I have nothing against form-based codes and it's certainly a tool that any town may want to consider. Um, our particular one has been, had some success in some things that are, we're working on. I've actually currently got a large uh, sort of process and usability overhaul in front of our council to try and clean up some of the uh, bits and pieces that don't mesh very well and give us a, a more clear process that'll help us uh, work this through a little better with applications in front of the planning board, more on the staff and review side. But um, I guess I'd be interested in any more specific questions you have. Uh, um, it's a big topic. Yeah, no, it is a big topic. And thanks for that start, um, Scott. <clears throat> I guess one of the things that I thought about, uh, you know, when you, when we had the opportunity to invite you was, I don't know Standish. And I was surprised to see that Standish and Thompson are very close to the same size. I don't know about geographically, but population wise. And it sounds like Standish is a little different in having a couple of kind of town center locations. Whereas I think um, what I would describe Topsom as is having a wannabe town center. Um, that's a walkable town center. We seem to have a lot of envy about Brunswick as you know a, a walkable town center, and we want to move. You know, our 2019 comprehensive plan basically asks the town in our upcoming planning efforts to move to do our best to move toward um, keeping rural and nature areas the way they are to the extent we can um, to sort of strengthen our tax base through um, focusing growth in the center of town where we already have uh, water sewer and to, to the extent that we can to create a walkable town center um, 
however we define that. And to when you're talking about walkable, um, most many of our roads, you know, we focus those roads on vehicular mobility. You know, people moving through town to get to where they're going. Um, it's not particularly uh, pedestrian and bicycle friendly. So to try to begin to balance that off a little bit. So it seemed to us when we undertook this, you know, project to look at how do we do this, um, there were some catalyst sites in Thompson. And rather than pick one or two of those, we said, let's look at the entire growth area, center of town, and see whether or not it makes sense to bring either form-based code as such or some kind of hybrid mix of form-based code so that we have more success at having um, a built environment that is attractive and that offers public spaces where the public spaces are the priority, not the rights of individual build, uh, landowners to do as they like. And our code, the code that we have now dates back it's been changed in bits and pieces, but it dates back nearly 40 years. So it needs, you know, it needs some review. And we thought this would be a good opportunity to look at the center area um, to bring some form-based code and beyond that to do some cleanup and update. So it, you know, and we've, and we've lost our long-term planner who helped to bring this project about. So we're, we're at the point where I think the, the um, Comprehensive Plan Implementation Committee is beginning to feel more comfortable in looking at the draft of the new code. We've gone through one revision where it sounds like what you have in Standish is, um, is, is very granular in terms of very specific zones and then partials within the zones. And we've done, we've taken one step away from that to make it a little bit more, a little less granular, a little, and, and to keep the nomenclature of the areas of town that we are familiar with um, in, in making those changes. But nonetheless, it's, you know, hearing your experience, I'm curious how long you've been planner there and when the form-based code process um, came in, things like that. So I've only been in Standish for uh, not even two years yet, um, but the form-based code was adopted, I believe in 2011. Okay, wow, that's a long time ago. It was, it was one of the first in the state, I, to my understanding. And to be honest, I think that's been part of our issues is there's uh, some lessons learned yeah. on that. But um, I may, I don't, again, I don't know how much you want me to, to answer some broad planning questions that maybe are stepping away from form-based code itself into getting to some of the issues you've brought up in that introduction of where you're at. Because uh, there's some, I'm going to just, I guess I have to preface this. That some of the things I'm going to say are not necessarily accepted practice or like the real, the rules that maybe you talk to a different planner and they're going to disagree with you, but with me. And, but this is how I approach planning my experience, both here in Standish and in other towns about what I have felt to be effective. And that is going to maybe not strictly dovetail with the words form-based code. You talked a lot about walkability and access between different parts of town, non-vehicular. Non and for me personally, that's an infrastructure issue a lot of the time. But I mean, yes, there's two elements of it, depending on just exactly where you're talking about is a how close together are things, in which case zoning can help you with that. 
And then there's the infrastructure, how safe are your roads, are there sidewalks and things like that. And in my experience, both in general and in Standish's form-based code, zoning is very bad at building infrastructure. And whether it's form-based code zoning or it's traditional zoning, you, it's very hard to build infrastructure under zoning because you're only ever looking at a property at a time and it ends up being done piecemeal and people fight you and you end up with a bit here and a bit there and nothing ever gets completed in terms of sidewalks, in terms of bike lanes, in terms of road improvements. It's, it, you can't make a property owner build you a brand new road unless they're building a whole subdivision or something, in which case, mm -hmm. by all means, road standards are great. So that gets very, it, it's very hard to do in zoning, as much as those are all very good planning things to consider when you're doing zoning. Where we get into form-based codes, and I think it's a, a bit of a buzzword, is a form-based code at its core is focused on the sort of built environment, I mean, at the massing, the sizing of buildings, and depending on where you are, the, the architectural appearance of those buildings, and in theory should be not very concerned with what you're using those buildings for. That, to, to go to a, a very like planning 101 definition, your, your traditional Euclidean zoning is based on uses, what is happening here. Form-based code is largely not very concerned with uses. It's just concerned with, okay, well, how much building can you fit here? How tall is it gonna be? How big is it gonna be? Where on the lot is it placed? And so if you're, it can be very helpful in a situation like a downtown where you maybe already have a lot of development and you're trying to figure out how to fit new development and infill development within that structure, that built environment that you already have. And that's where it can be a very good tool. But if you're more worried about what uses are there, you can achieve some of that without a full technical form-based code. You can, you can just have some architectural standards that lay out some of these things. And I think if you've taken a look at Standish's form-based code, you're gonna see a lot of things that are becoming a little more common, but are still not very common in zoning, at least in Maine, where we have what the ordinance calls a build to zone. And that includes not just a minimum setback, but a maximum setback mm -hmm. to make buildings be built up along the road where they already are in some cases, or at least in theory, that's what they should be doing. It's trying to line up that street wall so that you're getting a consistent uh, experience as you go down the road. So that is the kind of thing that you'll see in a form-based code. I don't strictly know if it's necessary to do an entire form as code to do that. It's, it's getting a little uh, wonky here, but I, again, buzzwords versus what you actually do. I don't know if that's starting to, to get to some of your, <laughs> your issues. Andy, did you have a comment question? Yeah, um, Scott, one of the big, and you've helped a lot right now, just in, the, I was taking some notes when you were just taking, but the general public and people within the community, when they hear form-based code, they have no clue what it means. Um, and I don't think we've done a great job in explaining the difference between a form-based code and a traditional <clears throat> set of codes zoning. Um, but you, you can, if I caught your um, comments correctly, you're saying that a form-based code is more focused on the buildings, the infrastructure, the size and the location as opposed to the use. Is that a, is that a very simple definition? Yeah, and I mean, that's the, the form and the form-based code is the form of the building is we're looking more at what does it look like than what is it housing? Yeah. It's, it's the, the basic of it. So is there is there an in between that you can you can still have some form based code requirements but some use code requirements together or do they have to be totally separated? No, I mean things like a build like a maximum setback is something you can easily incorporate into traditional zoning. Right. I mean it's and architectural standards are 
a basic component of a lot of say historic districts and things like that where they lay out does it need to have a flat roof or, or can it have a flat roof or remain? You're gonna see a lot of historic districts say, oh no, you have to have a sloped roof. You need to be within these styles is the kind of thing. And those would be an architectural standard. They are concerned with the form of the building, but they can be worked together. I mean, that, I'm not gonna be, I think too much about these things all the time. So form-based yeah, code is, a, is an idea but it is, there's not, it's very hard to pick up a code and say, this is entirely a form-based code and this is entirely a non-form-based code. Yeah, it seems like form-based code throw, with, with the architecture and some of the requirements throws in a, a, another level of responsibility for the community. And, and is form-based code in a strictest sense and requirements something that a town of 10,000 people should be even looking at? I'm, I'm thinking it's too much. It's, we don't have yeah, it a, depends. We don't have a um, historical review committee we, that I know of. We don't, you know, it's, it's just a lot to administer. It depends exactly what you're looking at. A bit. I mean, in our case, yes, that's exactly what form-based code is meant. Is it something that I spend a lot of time working with property owners, walking them through, helping them figure out how it works? Because ours is a very complicated one. At its heart, uh, the original concept around the form-based code was basically just, okay, these are, this is your, we're gonna define what your building envelope is. We're gonna define how tall your building is. And then you don't, we're not gonna ask you what you put in it for. And we're done. And you don't have to have a detailed architectural standards. You're mostly just saying, where on the lot can you build? And there you go. The, uh, the original idea was very simple, much like the idea around original zoning was, well, this use probably shouldn't be next to that use. And yet we still end up with 200 page zoning ordinances. So anything can be complicated and nothing necessarily has to be. No, that's a good point. That's a good point. And, and I'm not professing to be a professional planner or zoning expert. So, and I don't think, I mean, we're all, we all know a little bit enough to be dangerous, I guess, but if we can put our thoughts together and, <clears throat> and learn from experiences from people like you, then I think we could probably get there. But I still think it has to be a hybrid of some type in our community. And again, that's just my my opinion as one member of the committee. And it, it is almost always to some extent. You, even the most loose form-based codes are almost are always going to have some uses that are not allowed. You're not going to allow, allow a concrete plant in your downtown like there's going to be some things that you want you want to say <laughs> that aren't, aren't going to be compatible with the other things around and that there's always some of that it's like i say it's it's that's sort of the misnomer of this kind of a discussion is nothing is straight one or the other you know scott this is a helpful thing i think even for the three of us who are members of the committee and the town manager and assistant town manager to be part of this conversation because it, it, it forces us to think about how much do we actually understand about form-based code, you know? And now the, the description that you gave in terms of, um, you know, how it compares and contrasts with um, what's called Euclidean code. And I, I, I initially thought like, what the heck does that mean? Is that a mathematical thing? It's like, no, it's Euclid, Ohio. And it's the, the thing that started to help some of us make sense of what might be the value of form-based code is when we have a property that's, I don't even know if it's two or three acres, whatever the heck it is, it's, it's a vacant property right now, right on our main street. And the owner of that property developed a sketch, very rough, but it was enough of a sketch to sort of allow the consultants we're working with to create the contrasting process that the planning board would go through now with our current code compared with what this would be like with form-based code. And it's just simply with the draft that had already been submitted, a form-based code. 
And it so clearly showed that the process with form-based code would be much less ambiguous, much clearer, much faster because it absolutely showed, does it meet the standard? Yes or no, or what's needed? It, there's a checklist that was offered that made it like, I mean, I was sitting with the planning board who had otherwise not had much engagement with this at that point. And they really began to understand what the benefit of form-based code could offer to the, the planning and project review process. So it sounds like your, what the code that Standish has, as I've heard you describe it, is overly complicated. And that's one of the things that we, I think, recognize right away, especially in what's called our lower vi village. The, you know, the, the person who is an expert at form-based code that we're working with took a very parcel by parcel approach to this. And we realized that we really needed to step away from that level of complexity. So right now, what we have to work with and talk about is a little bit more general. Um, but, you know, I'm, we get the chance on the committee to actually hear each other state our opinions <laughs> about form-based code. So thank you, Andy. Um, I, I think what we have to look at now, our first revision is actually, um, it is a hybrid. I can't pretend to tell you I understand what the heck that means, you know, because I've compared it to the original one and it just seems to be a little bit less getting into the weeds, a little bit less granular. And my hope is that it will still allow us to have um, a built environment over the next decade or two that will offer what we want and less of what we don't want. One of the things, and I don't, I'd be love to hear how, how it's worked in Standish is you drive down Main Street, you drive down all of those center growth areas of town, and a lot of what you're looking at in any of the commercial or mixed use areas, zoning areas, is a parking lot. And like that is not attractive, nor is it necessary. And if you can take that same lot size and bring the building up to the street and put the parking lot behind, you're gonna have a lot more attractive built environment. Now, I, I would assume that you'll tell us you can achieve that without form-based code. Man, I, again, I guess the, the stumbling block here for me is that a form-based code is just an idea. It's not a, a reality. Uh, you could, I mean, a, a nice checklist of review, I would say you can get that in any competent zoning overhaul should exactly result in that. And whether you're looking at form or you're looking at use, we should all be endeavoring to make our zoning ordinances easier to read, to interpret, and to apply. That is a goal that we should all have. Because all our towns have had this, the code you have that was originally adopted in the 80s and has just been amended and pieced together and added on to for decades. And now we have a, a shambling, shambling monster of bits and pieces that get in its own way. And that's what it is. That's what zoning is. That's why towns have people like me to spend all their time reading them and make sure they know all those pieces. It's, it's well, there's not a lot we can do about it, but when looking at these things, when overhauling our zoning ordinances, we should always be endeavoring to make them as easy to use as possible. And that, you can do that no matter what type of zone you wanna do, that doesn't really matter what it looks like on the end, that matters on your site plan review criteria, your guidance to the planning board that's in there. And I think the, it's a false dichotomy of traditional zoning versus form-based zoning like the, the the language came out of some academic somewhere 
thinking about zoning said, our zoning is too focused on uses. We need to look at the form of our built environment. Here's an idea for a form-based code. And that's great. I think that that is something that was has been neglected in zoning for a long time and now largely isn't. But the concept of I have to have a, a form-based code, if you're talking about form in your zoning ordinance, then you have a form-based code. I, I don't it's not really a, an either or. And now you end up with something like we have that is very complicated if you try and do both all the time. And we end up with our form-based code section in our ordinances as long as the rest of the zoning ordinance put together. And it covers just a little portion of town because it's doing all the things that all the other zoning ordinances parts are doing and then it's doing them again for all the little pieces and then it's adding all the architectural standards on top of that and it's it's huge and I don't think it needs to be that way but that's what they did when they did it that was 10 years ago and they're still figuring out how these things worked and I have a variety of thoughts about how our zoning when this was done and how I would do them differently uh, so that so hopefully now would result in something a little easier to use but you absolutely you can in a relatively simple way have parking that's not up at the front of the lot. I mean, you, a lot of zoning already has separate setback requirements for parking as, than buildings. And that can easily be put in a front parking setback that keeps it, and then a maximum building setback. And now your building has to be so close and your parking has to be so far away. Or a language we see a lot in zoning ordinances is just that parking must be to the side and rear of a building. And it can be as simple as that. Um, I've kind of a follow-up question, Scott, on what you were just saying. You mentioned earlier that you've got, I think, some changes you guys are proposing for adoption. And then you mentioned the code was too Byzantine, which I think you maybe just alluded to again, some of the things you're trying to switch. But can you give a little more specifics about things that you wish weren't in there or maybe things we should avoid putting in ours? Or? Ours is too long. Is this just the, the, the short, long and short of it? As I tried to get into, we've got a hierarchy of things within the, the ordinance. And this is not uncommon in a form based code, if, especially if you're trying to get really into building a center. And you think one way of thinking about it is a hierarchy of roads. You've got your primary road through, and then you've got smaller residential streets or smaller commercial streets that come off of that. And our ordinance breaks down each of those street types and defines them and then lays out what the, stand, the building form and lot uh, development standards are for each type of street. And that means a lot of words put down for a lot of, for a very small area. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does get very repetitive and when the ordinance was written, it maybe was not written to the standards that I have. And there were elements that got lost in all of that verbiage, things that were contradictory in terms of some overall standards that are in there versus the individual street standards. And a lot of confusion in people saying, well, my property can do this, my neighbor's property did this other thing, how is that? when, because it was not very clear to the average person who wasn't sitting down and reading all of this, what all these distinctions were. So that's come into a lot of confusion. We haven't been able to fully change that in what I'm proposing, but we have streamlined a lot of the things. The building form standards have been sort of generalized into a single overarching one so that it's all in one section. You can sit down and read that rather than having to go through each street frontage type and find it for each different section. And similarly moved a lot of the um, sort of development uh, where your building can be, your setbacks and your building form standards and that of that way, that's sort of non-architectural, just massing stuff into a single table so that you can just look in one place and see in each street frontage type what those numbers are that guide that. Just trying to consolidate it and make it easier to find things uh, for people. And that, that's helped a bit. And 
if you're going to look at streets like that, breaking down a hierarchy of streets, you got to be very clear about how that works. Um, that's always a confusion we have when we talk about rezoning things. If you've got a really, I don't know how many big parcels are left in the areas you're looking at, but in our Standish Corner Zone, there's some large 40, 50 acre parcels that come off of the main road. The way our zoning ordinance is written, when you develop those parcels, you're supposed to build a new road that goes in to serve all that area. And then because we're based on these street types, that new road becomes the zoning for that, that lot. So anything built that gets access off of that new road has to meet that zoning. But until that road is built, the portion of the lot that fronts on whatever road exists now is on the zoning that is appropriate for that road. And wrapping a, people's head around the, the zoning changes when you start to build on it is, is a very tricky thing, uh, as you might understand from what I just told you. Right. Yes. I think we could probably explore that for a couple of minutes. And I think Joe has a question comment. I've, I've, yeah, I've got several actually. Your <clears throat> your characterization uh, about Euclidean and uh, farm based, or I, I actually prefer character based, uh, but regardless of how we're referring to it, that we're really not talking about uh, two uh, two utterly different things, but there's a continuum. Is that that fair to say? Yeah. So when, when we first got into this, my expectations and my hopes for uh, character-based code uh, was that it would simplify the process for uh, the planning board and for people bringing things to the planning board because at least in my uh, initial understanding of it, uh, it, it was a lot more less verbose and more pictorially oriented um so you, you you know you did have uh you did have verbiage but you had pictures to support what that verbiage meant which to me made a lot of sense um the other hope i had for it was that it would uh that it would strengthen the existing character of uh of the i'll call it the original part of town what is main street but unfortunately is also route 201 um and uh and that it could in yeah. the future influence our catalyst sites which are uh semi-developed or undeveloped uh so that there would be some uh, some recognition that there is kind of a uh, an historic character to Topsom that can be uh, certainly not uh, not slavishly replicated, but could be uh, acknowledged. I guess is the best way of putting it. So I guess the question based on that is: Do you think, uh, from your experience, form-based code? stands a better chance of achieving those goals than Euclidean or because of your comment about the uh, the false dichotomy of the two codes that it, it's uh, it's hard to answer. I mean, your old school Euclidean zoning, that form-based coding is code, like the idea has been developed as a response to, did not address building form. Mm -hmm. pretty much at all and certainly not outside of historic districts and so that's yes of course having a form-based element is going to help you see a built environment that you want to see that you've written down into your ordinance and now whether you call that form-based code or if you wrote a code that you have now that has certain setbacks and you just added some other setbacks and some language that dictates where on the property you can build and how big a building you can build and that kind of thing. Where, where that bec stops becoming traditional Euclidean zoning or where that becomes form-based code, I don't know. That's, I guess, that's where form-based code is a way of looking at what you want and what you can have in your zoning. Uh, it's, it's not an either or, 
but it is that that is the type of thing that you need to incorporate in your ordinances in order to have that kind of a control over the built environment. Mm -hmm. And that can be very fine grain or that can be very big picture. I mean, sometimes form based code is just that you can have so big a building and it needs to be in this portion of your lot. And you leave what that building looks like entirely up to the person who owns the property. It doesn't necessarily have to be. We talk about architectural standards. We talk about the form based in a lot in the way of historic districts, but that's not what it has to be. Mm -hmm. We don't need to necessarily, you can build a very modernist building and I have a form code that would accept that if you so choose. It doesn't have to talk about materials or architectural styles. The most pure element of a form code is just going to be building massing and location. But again, that's up to you. It sounds like you guys have been talking to someone already about what this might look like for you. And that can in incorporate any number of things. And is going to depend a lot on what that is. My experience with my code written by a different person 10 years ago isn't going to have a lot of bearing on someone you hire now to write a code today. Um, okay. So I can give you some advice on what things to talk to them about and how to make it. And I think, but it sounds like you already have a code that seemed like it was laying things out clearly. And then it gets into the values of your town of what, how prescriptive you want to be, how the, the balance between letting people do what they want and making sure that what they end up, they do fits with what you have. It's a, it's what, what I struggle with is the issue of quality um, because you could have a, uh, you could have somebody replicate an historic building and have it be, be uh, fit much less well into uh, an historic context if it's not done well. Uh, it, it might be better to have a modern building that is uh, of higher quality and, and more, more thoughtfully designed. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know that there's even a question here except that uh, that that's an element of what we uh, that's that I think is the most difficult thing to control. Um, what one another question that I had was you you came in uh, well after uh, meaning you you started in Standish well after the, uh, the, the Standish code was adopted. Um, What's your observation about uh, the uh, the feelings of people who were there at the time it was initiated and pushed that? Are they glad they did it? Did they feel that it's been successful in achieving their goals, even if it uh, needs to be modified? Uh, do, you, do you have a sense about that? I have not had a conversation with anyone who has self-identified as a huge proponent of it, to be honest. How did it get done then? <laughs> I mean, a lot of work was done. It took them years. There was, uh, I believe they had a lot of grant money from uh, Grow Smart Maine to come in and help them look at it and help write the ordinance. Um, the planner at the time was certainly behind it and people who supported it. I just have, I don't know if they haven't been paying attention in recent times, they haven't turned up or if they're, they don't see we're making big changes so they don't need feel the need to, to bring it up. Or if they've, I mean, it's been 10 years, maybe they aren't around anymore. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've certainly met people who think it's doing okay, but I haven't met anyone who says, don't touch it. <laughs> mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean they aren't there and maybe they're they don't feel the need to say anything because we haven't tried to make any major changes what what would you uh do you have a list of pitfalls that we should try to avoid that you've observed in the implementation of this 
I mean, I think the biggest thing for me, and this is form-based code, any code, is always the goal should be simpler is better. But that, again, as my caveat from the beginning, that's a personal approach. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. maybe not everyone is going to agree that it's possible to do good, uh, a good zoning without being some, somewhat complicated. But especially if, like you say, you're trying to get into character and quality of building, and that's not there's no good way to do that. So people trying to do that are gonna get, put a lot of words on the page. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Scott, do you have a lot of conditional uses allowable in your zone or is, have those been narrowed down or are there? Cause those are always subjective and that's one of the struggles. Yeah, good question. I mean, what I just do you mind giving me a little context? What you mean by conditional? Well, in, in a certain zone, you've got so many things allowed, and then you've got a whole another layer of allowances, conditional, meaning eh, bring them to us. We'll look at them from a planning board standpoint. And if we like them, okay. But if we don't, no. It's so subjective. You know, yeah, a lot of those. We try not to have that. Uh, the form based code until some language that's in front of the board right this second. Uh, the council of, uh, has not had any conditional uses. It's allowed or not allowed. I mean, well, allowed, allowed a planning board review, like site plan review, or not allowed. We do have, we don't have conditional uses, but we have uses of, with special exemption that the board of appeals has to review, but they are reviewed against certain criteria. It is not a subjective, this is appropriate or not. It is a review against certain impacts that are going to maybe be project dependent, but they have to go through an extra level of review to say, we're not going to damage the environment. We're not gonna have a huge impact on roads or public services, that kind of thing. It's not a character-based, is this use appropriate for this area? So let's just go back for a second. Um, I heard you, Scott, say that two out of the three sort of town center areas of Standish have form-based code. Are those two areas, um, is the form-based code applied in areas that are completely mixed use, residential, commercial, whatever? Yeah, I mean, and that is part of the, certainly the goal of our form-based code is to encourage mixed use. Yeah. And portions of, some of the districts, the Sandwich Corner District in particular, as your writer is, it's centered on a major intersection, uh, 25 and 35. Yeah. And the street frontage types closest to that area actually don't allow uh, residential uses on the first floor unless you're building a, a huge like apartment complex, in which case you can, but uh, if they're trying to encourage commercial uses on the first floor, residential uses on the second floor. And then the types of uses allowed again, they're, they're trying not, I believe we don't even allow single family housing in a couple of those zones because again, these are right at the corner where we're trying to develop that walkable business focused node. And then as you get out in the hierarchy there, if you're gonna build a new residential subdivision and you build a new road in there, you build a street, residential street frontage type road and you have your residential neighborhood on it. When you, when you mentioned a few minutes ago, Scott, the, that you have a couple of parcels right off one of your main roads that are like 40 or 50 acres, did that get into something called a master plan development or, because it sounds like the issue gets very complicated in terms of sort of what's allowed in there based on the main road that exists. And then once the road is built and approved that they are required to build, different things will be allowed based on that, that hierarchy. But is have you gotten in, is your code getting into master plan development or not? Uh, they don't exactly call it that, but yes, uh, when you go to develop a large parcel, the, as part of what you do, you're supposed to show to the planning board that you're not 
that you're able to then continue developing that parcel within the bounds of the code. And as you, depending on what you're building and where and how, you may be required to start building that new road. Um, one of the parcels is looking at some large footprint commercial buildings, and but they're going to be set back from the main road now. So they have to build an access way to get there. The way our code is written, they're gonna to have to build that access way up to the road standard so that future development around that access way is now fronting on one of these new roads that is gonna foster the expansion of this name, this area rather than just dead ending in a park. So it is there. They're supposed to give an idea of how this is gonna be broken down in the future. And World. It has limited testing so far. We have not had a lot of uh, big development into the last 10 years. The one residential subdivision has been built out uh, within or under this code and is people are living there now. It's still being built, but there's people in it. And there's another one that people aren't living in yet, but is under construction. And like I said, we have one property that looks like it's going to have a commercial development that we'll be testing that in the near future. I mean, we've had plenty of small things go in, but in terms of this, what you're talking about of taking a large parcel and starting to develop it out as this, it's really has only happened in the residential so far. I, I think if I know where the two neighborhoods that you're talking about, I think I've driven through them probably the past one of maybe the past 40 years, the, the Standish Corner, and then the other one at least the past 20 years, the late one. Um, and at least in the probably the center of those two districts, I haven't really noticed a lot of change as far as what's there. Do you think the prescription on what the buildings needs to look like has held back the economic development or not? Not to my knowledge. Um, a lot of it is the small lots infill development and the attitudes of the property owners, if you, especially right down in the, the very centers. I mean, like I said, this, I don't, if you're familiar with it coming in on um, what is it, Ossipee Trail. So if you're coming it's from like, Gorham, it used to be a nice library, grocery store, up uh, 25, yeah. there's the Hannaford off one side and yeah. that was developed prior to the code. There's a couple big fields there. They have not been developed, but partly that was the property owner for a long time, wasn't selling it. It has changed hands. That's one of the ones that might be coming up in the near future. And we'll see um, as you get to the actual center uh, on the other side of 35, again, none of that property has changed hands in, since before this code was implemented and now some work has been done. We've worked with property owners to overhaul or expand their existing businesses. And it has been some of the architectural standards and these are some of the things that we are streamlining in the code we're currently changing. Have had to struggle a little bit with designing their buildings because they were having trouble fitting into that code, partly because they are uses that are not ones that are really what the code wants to see in that area, but they've been there forever or they're in a limited spot. So it's allowed there, but the code didn't really think about it because again, the code didn't think about everything. Okay, thanks. I, I wanna sort of broaden out for a second. And um, I, I guess I'm wondering if, you're in, I appreciated earlier on, Scott, when you talked about, you know, this is stuff that you think about all the time. <laughs> and, um, and are you in touch with planners in other cities and towns that have had, you know, a similar experience of, you know, bringing form based into certain areas and, um, and, and, and how that's going. I mean, the only place that I've sort of heard about anything from a distance is Auburn, which is the city where I grew up, um, brought form-based code into a very small part of its downtown. And they were 
from what I've heard, so happy with it that they're now expanding that out. That's, you know, second and third hand knowledge. So I, you know, I haven't talked to folks. I'm just curious oh, if you have not, to you. not in a, any detailed way that I could give you any real like status report on how things go. And again, the language depends on who you talk to, what is form-based code or not. So I think that uh, I, the way I remember it being pitched when they did it was that uh, a lot of uh, Falmouth's Route 1 rezoning a few years ago uh -huh. incorporated a lot of form-based code elements. And I don't know if they're still calling it form-based code or, or what, it, what it really ends up being, but I, they seem to have had some success with working with again that they're focused more on large properties in commercial development in the areas that they did this in but that was a thing uh portland has a form-based code on their india street yeah that was uh adopted only uh i guess it's been a few years now it's probably been five or six years they've had that down there and unless it took them longer to get it in than I remember. But uh, again, that's a, a, it's a very dense area, but it had, it was an area for Portland Peninsula. had some infill development opportunities. So they were very concerned about what it was gonna look like new buildings to fit into what was already there. And I live in Portland, so I, get, I know a bit about that just as reading the newspaper, but from what I and from some consulting I work I did back when I first got into this, but um, from what I remember that they, they did it as sort of an alternative to a historical district, sort of a compromise of they didn't as I think uh, Joe was saying earlier that about the character a they didn't want to restrict things to copying historic elements, but they wanted to make sure it fit within. So I think that's was the a lot of the pitch from the neighborhood group to push for form based code there. And I haven't heard anybody complaining about it, but I'm not in close touch with uh, the staff there. Um, I want to say that Freeport also did some uh, form based code, but I'm not 100% sure on that. For their downtown area, but I You'd have to, to talk to them about it. I don't remember exactly. I know they were looking into it for trying to get a feel for bringing their zoning ordinance requirements into line with what actually exists. I mean, I'm sure as you guys have looked at these things, it sounds like you've looked at it in your area that a lot of the zoning ordinances we have don't match what already exists. All the properties are non-conforming and then someone goes to build something and they want it to look like the ones next door and they can't. And so they were doing a big study on what they have, what's conforming, what's not conforming to, to see how they can bring their code to be more friendly with the built environment they already have. But I don't remember what came of that in the end. Hmm. One of the things I guess that comes to mind is, you know, uh, in some of the early documents that our consultants prepared, they talked about um, bringing best practices into play, um, understanding that Topsum's code hadn't really been overhauled in quite a few years in a comprehensive way. And I'm wondering, you know, not as not a planner, <laughs> um, what would some of the things be top of mind in terms of what are some of the best practices that because it sounds like you know in that continuum between euclidean and form-based code um form-based code was seeking to do certain things that now have become or to some extent best practices and are no longer requiring the use of that kind of code but like if you if you talk about we're going to pay attention to best practices and have our code reflect that. What are, what are some of those things that are in your experience? Uh, code is such a variable thing. Um, it's hard to say. Um, so again, this is where we get into my 
personal opinions as a planner, not necessarily, I don't know what I would call, if there's any generally accepted best practices, that's, uh, well, I don't really know if there is such a thing, but. I mean, what comes to mind is, you know, does the, is it the main planning association or the main association of planners or whatever? Yep. Yeah. Um, I have not looked into what they do, but um, that might be a source of information for us. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a member. Um, I, <laughs> we had, there are, there are sort of a subset of the Northern New England chapter of the American Planning Association. We just had our conference uh, last month. Right, right. So it's a, I don't, we, they don't have the next, it's not like they develop model ordinances. That's all a bunch of people that work. They're a bunch of people like me <laughs> that, yep. that are, are here doing their jobs. So uh, I don't know how much if they have, again, best practices, but other than doing zoning. Um, yeah. For me, personally, the way I, it's trying to simplify zoning. It's gotten too complicated over the years. And part of that it, for me is, and maybe this is a move from Euclidean closer to form-based code is one of the things that I'm trying to do these days. And maybe it's not just me, because I think, because Portland is recently, is in the process of a, a two-step process of overhauling their zoning ordinance. And they, so they've done the first step. And part of that is greatly simplifying the use lists. Where I've run into towns and you've broken down everything that you allow uh, in such a granular way so that doctor's offices are allowed over here, but you can't open a barber shop and except for over there. And is a doctor's office really that much different from a barber shop? They're both a customer oriented. They have similar appointment schedules and number of people that are there at any given time. And at what point does professional services or office space cover all these things? And so if Town of Standish gave me the go ahead to, to rip up our zoning ordinance and really clean it up, that one of the things I do is take the, I don't know, 50 odd, more than that, uh, some absurd number of defined uses we have and make it into something much more straightforward. You know, we've got like something on the order of a hundred defined uses in our zoning. I think ordinance. we're right there with you, Scott. Right, it's Scott. common. And it just yeah. is, gets to a point where how many of these things are really needed? How different really are they? But that's, again, that's the thing that I do. I don't know if that's considered best practices and I don't wanna start making more work for, for, for you if that's not what you're doing. But. <laughs> Well, it, it felt like a, when I heard about what our use table contains, including some blank spots that aren't helpful at all, um, and we started looking at will form-based code or a hybrid be a helpful way to go, it was a huge relief to me that we will not have to, that that is to some extent taken care of because you just, it, it's not that it's not concerned with use at all, but it's much more minimally concerned with use. There are some broad strokes, but it doesn't get into the doctor versus barbershop, does not care at all about that. It wants to, to tell the building where it's gonna be and how tall it's gonna be and the roof options and things like that um, and where the parking is. So I think we've taken an hour of your time and we really appreciate your uh, sharing your experience with us. Sounds like you've got some good work ahead. <laughs> and if there are any last minute questions, throw them out. No, I, I just thank you very much, Scott, for doing this. <clears throat> it, it's really helpful uh, to- No, always happy to. Put the face of reality on, uh, on something <laughs> that has right. uh, been, been kind of too theoretical for us to date. Yeah, I think that's for me. If I have a message for you coming out of this, that's what it is: is that don't get too hung up on the labels. It, if it's form-based code, if it's not form-based code, does it matter if it's doing what you want it to do? And if you won't, don't want to worry about a ton of uses, then you don't have to. And it doesn't have to be that you're changing your zoning from one type to another type. 
it just means you're simplifying your uses. That's its own thing. And now maybe that's something that form-based code says you should do, but it doesn't mean, like, it, there's, it's not a whole separate thing. It's all zoning. <laughs> right. I and, just and want to voice thank you too. Yeah, we appreciate your time and uh, and your honesty. And the thing that I have as a takeaway is simpler is better. <laughs> That's what I I try to do anyway. Can't go wrong with that, right? I think we're we're heading in that direction a little bit. Okay, Susan, can we hang on? Susan, can we hang on for a couple minutes after um, after Scott the recording leaves. stops? <laughs> Yes. I don't care whether the recording's on or not. I just want to ask a couple questions about Monday night. Sure. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Yeah. Um, when I, I'm sorry I had to leave Monday night. Uh, yeah, it was Monday night.